testing. One, two. All right. We are sorry we did not make enough handouts. Nicole's very sorry because she's the one who didn't make enough. Just <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Wonderful. Uh, very humbled and honored that you would come and listen and, and, and partake and be interested and, uh, uh, you know, receive, I don't know, just the call to be, to be, uh, to be used in the kingdom. And to also very encourage that people would come and, you know, stay informed kind of what's going on here uh, in Kelowna, in my head, in, in just uh, what I feel is a continuation of just the, the leading of the Lord in this journey of restoration, uh, reformation, revival. So what, just as I get going, and I just want to welcome our live stream audience uh, share this out. Hit your share button and share this out. I'm going to ask the Lord for help here. Um, we, were, we were together a month ago, four weeks ago. And on four, week, four weeks ago, I had a bit of a woo day. Um, it was just <laughs> in the spirit, and I, I, got this massive, I got this headache. Guess what I got today, about three hours ago? Whack. This time, I'm like, okay, I'm just, yeah, not since, not since, just right now, I'm like, this is, it's not coincidental. Yeah, we do. And uh, so I said some prayer, rebuked some stuff, and I took some Tylenol. <laughs> yeah. I do trust God, I do lock my door. Okay. Okay. So, apparently the enemy doesn't want us gathering or even talking about this stuff or celebrating God's voice, the gifts of the Spirit. They're very contested by religion, religion, religious people. And there's a reason. And uh, because the enemy can't afford... The enemy can't afford to allow you guys to speak for God, uh, the things of God, to reveal secret things in others' lives, words of knowledge, etc. Uh, the enemy doesn't want us knowing the times and seasons. The enemy doesn't want us speaking like having God speak through us because that's dangerous. So he opposes we're going to talk a little bit about that tonight. And uh, my, at least my notes <laughs> did not erase today. I was a little panicked at one point. Something erased by itself. I'm like, oh, you're no. And it wasn't, okay. So I'm just like, are you serious? Just like, so I'll probably be nicer <laughs> tonight. No, it's it's true story. Uh, I did get some very encourage, encouraging notes and letters a long letter from Brad Trail, a buddy of ours in, Sask in Saskatoon. He said, I, he goes, Art, I've just been watching and listening and just like, um, he goes, the boldness that you had on uh, January 5th and stepping into this authority, I said, yeah, I, yeah, I was a little cranky <laughs> of just the, the religious quo and just like the, just in the opposition. And, and so sometimes people take it as arrogance or uh, um, just, you know, an, un, an unrighteous anger. But truth is, I'm very angry with what the enemy has done in neutering the church. And I do call it that. Because most of the pastors out there are neutered. Okay, I, now I need to stick my notes, see? <laughs> or no. So, let's pray. Let's start over there. Let's ask God to lead. Woo! <laughs> just to let you know Gimli is not neutered he's got more gojones and some just 
So, Father, I call upon you tonight. We do. We want to know. We want to be, see you move. We want to hear you speak. We want to see your governance. We want to see the family of God the way it's supposed to be. We want to see the kingdom manifest, not just churchianity, but the kingdom of God manifest. In Canada, we want to see uh, <clears throat> your power and your glory manifest through your people. Would, would, we want to see older, younger, used of you, empowered by you, gifted and graced of you. And Father, tonight we, we're looking for truth and we're looking for encouragement. We're looking for breakthrough. We declare it's here. Breakthrough is coming. It has come and it will come. And I pray, Father, for those who are hungry and wanting to know and wanting to have freedom and breakthrough for their ministry and for their towns, I just pray, Father, that you give them ears to hear. And I, I pray, Father, that you'd lead me, lead us uh, by your Spirit tonight. In Jesus' name. Amen. Some, uh, do you remember what happened four years ago tonight? Do you remember that? O two O two twenty twenty. Right. You know we all watch this together, up in the upper room and in, uh, in 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 uh, downtown in our old office, and it's a prophecy from Bob Jones. Spoken around 25 years ago. Kansas City had been to the Super Bowl once in 1970. Bob Jones' word, 25, 20, 30 years later, something like that, was, I do not know the exact date that he spoke it, but it was, it was, I believe it was mid-80s, early 90s. When you see the Chiefs, Kansas City Chiefs, win the Super Bowl, you will know that revival is about to come and God is raising up his apostolic chiefs. Okay, so it would be a good 20, 25 years later that Kansas City would go to the Super Bowl. And yes, we believe, and you need to believe, that God can use stuff like that, that God can do things like that, that God can use world events to prophesy his truths. God actually uses, can use, the top sporting event in the whole world for his purpose, for his glory. So, um, what's the chance that on 0202 2020 that the Chiefs would indeed go to the Super Bowl and they would win, as you would, as you remember, I believe they were playing San Francisco, I believe, and I remember freaking out halftime. Why? They were tied 10-10. Like, oh my God, this is too freaking freaky. And see, part of this journey that all of us have been on, many of you even nationally, has been this um, battle for Canada, this repentance thing, getting right with God, repenting for rejecting the Holy Ghost, repenting for sins that we've done to the first peoples, a theft of the land, etc. Uh, theft, uh, uh, for repentance for 50 years of silence, somewhat, on the issue of abortion. Remember, we were together by chance, flukely, uh, with 28 other, 2,800 other people on the, on the night uh, of the 50th anniversary of, of abortion, being legalized together where we watched the movie Unplanned, where we repented. God would lead us on all this journey around the nation and different, you know, about every three, four months we'd get together with the nation and uh, in different venues. One of the things that we repented for, oh, you can let him down. Go see grandma. Go see grandma. Go see. Go see grandma. Yeah, there. That's, that's not actually his grandma, okay? Just, it's not my mom. It's, uh, no. Gimli goes every Friday night to Tim and Suzanne's for a sleepover. All right. Yeah. <laughs> uh, one of the things that we repented for was a rejection of the apostles and the prophets, but the apostles, when we, were, when we went to St. John 
New Brunswick, the home of Sir Leonard Tilly. Now, there's a couple things I'm going to repeat from a week ago, a month, a month ago, just to kind of bring you up to speed and on this track of what we're talking about here. Because for this first hour, we are talking about the fivefold restoration of it and the apostles and the pastors working together. We're not going to be so hard on the pastors tonight, right? Okay, because I've got notes. And um, <laughs> just don't veer off, right? And then for the last hour, we're going to look at seven aspects of the prophetic. We're going to talk about Kelowna, us, and the, uh, 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 an emerging prophets alliance right across this nation. And uh, we believe that God has heard, is hearing our prayers, and has heard and is answering. And, and, and the enemy is simply losing. Spirit of religion is losing. It's actually losing. Um, and, and, and God has heard our repentance. God is answering prayers of authority and power to come to the church and, and there's going to be incredible harvests come in. They're going to be shepherded, healed, delivered, set free. And there's going to be, like, the voice of God is going to be so clear through certain prophets, young and old. And there's going to be these apostles that come on the scenes that confront the powers that be, um, young and old, scary young, some, some apostles, and they're just going to just stand, boom, boom, and they're just going to have this. It's going to be wonderful. Why? Because God has heard our prayers. God has heard prayers of the firewall and all of the different things that we've done. One of the things that we did, we went to the home of Sir Leonard Tiller, Tilly, the one who was given by God the mandate to call uh, Canada, the dominion of Canada, after Psalm 72, 8, where it says he shall have dominion from sea to sea. That was his hometown, the first incorporated city of Canada. First is symbolic, uh, even where, where it says in 1 Corinthians 15, 52, I believe. It might be 46, I believe it's 52. Something about the prophetic, you have to, as prophetic people, you've got to understand. First, there's a sign in the natural. Almost always. And then the spiritual. This is what it says. First, the natural, then the spiritual. So Sir Leonard Tilly came from the first incorporated city. He was an apostle. First, the apostle. That's what it says. In, in, in 1 Corinthians 12, 28. It says, first is the apostle. Then, then in the church of God, first is the apostle, then the prophet, then workers of miracles, so on and so forth. Okay, so um, we went in September of 2019, repented for rejecting our forefathers and the apostles and just, uh, okay, so because what the church has done largely, 99.9%, we do not have those apostles, those offices anymore, according to them. No apostles, no prophets, um, and... Uh, Evangelists will put up with them as long as they're not in our church because they're hard to deal with. And, and uh, they're always complaining about us and saying, you know, we need to get outside and win the lost. So we don't want to hear that because it's convicting. Uh, so we have pastors and teachers largely for the most part. You know, so what we did is we went back, we repented, and we said we want the mantle. We want to see the apostles rise. Six months later, Bob Jones's word comes to pass that the Kansas City Chiefs go to the Super Bowl and they win. John 10.10, 10, of course, at halftime, came John 10.10 10 came to me and says, for the enemy comes to kill, steal, and destroy. But Jesus said, but I've come that you might have life, life more abundantly. And I'm like, there's such a war here. Kansas City Chiefs won, and it was two weeks later that we were then in Prospera Place contending for the prophets. Um, and, and I know this is too much for some, and this is, you know, but this is the way that you're, that prophets work and that you're, and cause we're, we're freaky and we, we like numbers and we like, we like freaky stuff and we like, we like, uh, to see numbers, you know, on a dash, on a clock, uh, license plates and God's talking to us and, 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 you know, your spouse who's not prophetic is rolling their eyes and just like, and, so, uh. It's, it's so true, you know, but here in this house, it's spreading like a, like a disease, but it's a good disease. It's like more and more expectation of God to speak because we should expect God to speak in various ways, whether it's dreams through people, through signs in heaven, stars, the whole thing, what the Bible, what the Bible says. So as most of you would know, 
you know, to do the Battle for Canada, Kelowna, because that's where we felt we needed to come. Why? I spoke about it last, last, last month. Uh, you know, this, a lot of this journey, it started in North Battleford, where 75 years ago, uh, kids were fasting and God fell and it shifted the whole world. The whole world. Just like the convoy two years ago shifted the world. 75 years ago, some kids who were fasting in an orphanage shifted the whole world when God fell. And out of it came prophetic presbytery. Prophetic presbytery is when you sit down, a couple prophets sit together, and they start to prophesy over people. They had it so powerful here one, uh, one day, back in the day here in Kelowna, Stacy Campbell had teams. I remember when I went to like a Todd Bentley conference, and it, there was presbytery in like a, in a big hall. And what a, you would go in, and you would, there's like 20 tables set up, like, well, two or three prophets at each table go and sit down, and they would start to pro- pray, and they'd prophesy over you. And they would record it on a cassette tape. Do you remember cassette tapes? They would give you the cassette tape. And you'd take it, and you would hold on to that. And, and usually, they were so dead-on accurate. It's called prophetic presbytery. Well, that kicked up in 1948 out of North Battleford. That's where that came from, okay? And, you know, gifts of the Spirit and, 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 and singing, singing in the Spirit and but Canada kind of went nuts and they rejected it largely. Out of it came a split, though. Even the even when PAOC said we don't like this, we don't want this, some young people said this is of the Lord. We need this, and they split away and they started the PAOC and they changed the letters around. It became ACOP, which is the Full Gospel Church. Came out of that because some people okay. So, um, <clears throat> but you know, largely it was very rejected and looked down upon. But 40 years, almost to the day that it broke out here, it broke out, broke out there in North Battleford. It broke out here. God did it here on Valentine's Day, okay? So, so I needed to come here with a bunch of freaky people and contend for the prophetic because it says, 2 Chronicles 20, 20, believe in his prophets and you shall prosper. Well, the, the ver- just before that, it says, um, believe in the Lord and you shall be established, or you should you know, believe in his prophets, you shall prosper. Okay, believe in his prophets, believe his prophets, you shall prosper. So, um, I, you know, there's believe in his prophets, you shall prosper. And there's a stadium here called Prospera Place. I'm like, I have to have that. Second Chronicles 2020. So I need it in February in the year 2020. So we got it, and I had to fight and pray and declare for eight months, li- living up on Lone Pine, looking at Prospera Place every morning, ooh, and contending. And finally, the guy shouted to me on the phone because he didn't want to rent me. And I just like, I, hey, we want that place. I don't care if it's a Tuesday to Thursday. He goes, fine, 20 grand. I said, fine, 20 grand a day. 20 grand a day. I said, I don't care. Because at first he's like, 12 grand a day. I'm like, well, okay. And then he's like, 20. He wanted to scare me. No, I'm not being scared. So we got in there, and, and then our sound guy from him, well, it's 20 grand a day for sound. 20, 20, and then it, it was just like, and it was just, there was a whole bunch of 20s going on <laughs> at the time. Thousands. And just like, <sighs> okay, so nonetheless, we were in there on uh, uh, 2020, February 20. And up till 20, February 18th and to, 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 to February 20th of 2020, we were in there contending for the prophetic just after the Kansas City Chiefs won the Super Bowl. Now, just uh, uh, a footnote or an aside, Kansas City did win again last year. Interesting about this, though, because, you know, uh, they, they won the Super Bowl again uh, three years later. But when, when Kansas City... When Kansas City won the Super Bowl in 1970, at the very same time, there was a revival going on in uh, that school. Where? Asbury. As Kansas City Chiefs win the Super Bowl, there's a revival going on in Asbury. What happens last year when Kansas City Chiefs win the Super Bowl? There's a revival going on in Asbury in the very same building. But this time, it was on the 75th anniversary of the Lord Battleford revival because it broke out on February 12th. 
February 12th, 75-year anniversary of North Battleford, Kansas City Chiefs win the Super Bowl, and Revival is in Asbury. So, I'm not saying this word wasn't fulfilled in 2020, but, it's, but all hell broke out right after that with COVID and other things. And so there's been contending. The firewall came on to play, into play. And uh, so we're, we, are, we are contending for this, and, and I'm just saying, here to say that we are absolutely winning. Something about Bob Jones, uh, and some of you would know that um, two years ago, so I'm, 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 I've got, I've got a, uh, some people would say an unhealthy fetish or, you know, concern with the eagle's nest, Bob Jones and the whole thing. Okay. Uh, that's that I'm like, why are you so consumed by it? Um, it's, it's simply something that I have to carry. You don't have to. As a prophetic voice, my kind of lane, and the Lord says, I want you, you know, and I got to go, actually, a guy reached out to me from the States 14 years ago, 15 years ago, said, I want you to come and hang out with Bob Jones for a weekend in like a chalet. I'm like, oh, okay. So in 2010, I went and I hung out with Ryan White, and we hung out in a living room, eight of us, with Bob Jones. So Interesting. You know, um, and, and I'm not going to go into that whole visit that I did with him there and, and so on and so forth. But it was interesting. You know, my grandma's Cree and there was this other First Nations man who was ashamed fully. He's half First Nations. He, was, he doesn't, he's fully, fully ashamed. And there's this other person who's a quarter sitting there in this group of eight. There's 10 of us all together. Um, and and uh, uh, Bob Jones is sitting there. And when somebody walked in and sat down, we felt this little breeze. It was kind of weird, like a little wind. And Bob Jones was sitting there. When he started talking, he goes, uh, he looked at me, this other lady, and this guy who was half First Nations. He goes, you, you, and you. He goes, you guys are First Nations, aren't you? You got First I'm like, and we don't look at it, right? I'm like, uh, yeah. He goes, yeah, because when the door opened, a little wind, did you feel the wind? I said, Yeah. He goes, yeah, a feather came on each of you, a First Nations feather. He's like, God told me, you guys are First Peoples, and there's something for you. Like, This is who Bob Jones was, and there's a whole bunch of really, really crazy, freaky stories about him that I'm not going to get into because we've got to move on. But uh, he was here, and he said the Lord spoke to him about Kelowna. This is one of the three eagle's nests of America. Um, all right. So two years ago, and, and, and now I met him in 2010, but he died. Uh, on, uh, on Valentine's Day, 214. And by the way, when, he, uh, he was buried on 222. Uh, Paul, um, John Paul Jackson, another Kansas City prophet, buried on 222. Paul Kane, buried on 222. Paul Kane died on, uh, like, uh, on the anniversary of, of the North Battleford Road, 212, Bob Jones, 214. There's a whole bunch of markers that people don't want to look at because it's kind of too, that's just weird. But, but for those who grab onto those things, and if you value them, if you value them, God wants to talk, because God, God likes to hide these things. Um, as I was, we were saying with Cheryl yesterday, uh, it's the glory of God to conceal matters, Proverbs 25 too, but it's the glory of kings to search them out. You know, so uh, when Bob Jones did die in 214, on Valentine's Day, he died on February 14th, of 2014, 214, 214, and it bothered me. It bothered me because I knew there was something more than just it being Valentine's Day in Bob Jones's word, did you learn to love? Some of you will know, say, I'm, I'm gonna fly through this, but in case there's some who don't. Um, two years ago, like, and I'd been bothered, I'm like, what's the riddle? There's something about 214, and, and, and on January 2, the first two of the year of 2022, um, I was reading this word about Bob Jones, and I looked at my Bible on the table, and the Lord says, it's in there, the riddle. I'm like, what, what's in there? And, like, I'm thinking, and I'm thinking 2.14, so I'm looking at you know, Isaiah 2.14, because you go to Isaiah first for everything, right? Everything prophetic is in Isaiah, and it wasn't there. I'm like, son, it's, it's not there. 2.14, 2.14. And then I saw in my mind 2 Kings 2. I'm like, so I went to 2 Kings 2.14, and it's, and it's, what is, it's, it's where Elisha says, Picks up the mantle and says, where now is the God of Elijah? 
Where now? So I felt the Lord is saying his death, and it's a riddle, there's a double portion to come for those who want it. And there's a mantle. And if you read the story of Bob Jones when he's nine years old, Gabriel shows up with double sil- a double trumpet, twins, two silver trumpets, blows it in his face on a dirt road when Bob Jones is walking. This horse pulls up, and it's a big angel, and a boom, scares the crap out of him, throws a big chunk of, of a bullhide on the road, a mantle. Bob Jones ran from that, nine years old. You probably would too. Just ran for years and years and years. There's a mantle, uh, that, uh, a double portion of this mantle for coming. It's going to look different than Kansas City Prophets, but I'm just telling you we're contending for it. So, okay. Ten years ago, uh, today, ten years ago today, and, and here, we're partly here for this, like everything is about to shift for you guys. And for Kelowna, everything is about to shift. Okay? Everything. Um, my my uh, attraction to the eagle's nest, I was so affected here in 96, 02, 03, 04, and, and uh, I, I, I started hearing about issues because you start to become friends with people and leadership and so on and so forth. Um, and I um, started to pray for the eagle's nest on January 3rd of 05. I just started praying. And, and we'd have live worship every Tuesday and we would pray for two things. The economy of Kitimat, which is now one of the best in all of BC, and the eagle's nest, which is not so good. Um, and and my my heart to pray for, because it wasn't finished. I felt that, see, it was a sovereign thing that God did here 40 years later. And and, and in all honesty, somebody needs to go to North Battleford and uncap the well there. It's not me. I don't know if someone can hear my voice. Sometimes you're supposed to go and re-dig, you're supposed to... uh, if, when, when the enemy comes and stops up a well, like they did in the Old Testament, sometimes they would just go and dig a new well. But sometimes you got to come back, take back that ground, kick the enemy off of the site, and actually unstop the well. It's going to happen here in this city. And it needs to happen in North Battleford. Um, <clears throat> so my, uh, I've been praying for so many years for here and stuff, and of course, you know, uh, when I moved here, and I am, I am, I, 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 like I said, I consider myself a spiritual son of the house of Kelowna. Wesley and Stacy took me under my wing, uh, took me under their wing, and, and just, and gave me a platform, and they believed in me, and so on and so forth, um, and so when I moved here, I'm like, what is this? Um, and, but as you know, when we, when we did Battle for Canada here in Prospera Place, it actually scared a lot of ministers of Kelowna. They wouldn't come. I was told by top ministers, no. One top apostle, I was talking to him like for two hours intensely. I was like, this is what God's doing and he wants to restore it. And he goes, I, I'm, 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 I'm scared of that. I'm like, I'm scared. Now I said, then stay home. But he did. And so it, it was like, and when we did that event, afterwards, I just wanted to move back to Kitimat because I can't, I could, there was this, there was lies in my head. There was, you know, rejection from not being, you know, in Kelowna here in 2020. And then, you know, of course, COVID hit and I got kicked off the ministerial. It didn't help. Da, 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 da. I'm like, uh-oh, I've already got a bad name. I just moved here. I was like, at least it took a while in Kitimat to get a bad name. Why not? <laughs> Didn't take long here. And uh, so, you know, there's something here that doesn't want that well uncapped. But 10 years ago today, uh, on February 1st, I flew into Miami. Sometime after midnight on February 2nd of 2014, 10 years ago today. And why did I fly fly into Miami? Me and Heather were, uh, were there to jump on a, on a cruise on February 2nd 
to go and lead worship for an Eyes and Wings cruise. Eyes and Wings was birthed out of Kelowna. It's part of the Nest Mandate. Okay. Nest Mandate, I'm there for that. February 1st, I go to bed like 11, midnight, maybe even into the hours of February 2nd, and I say a prayer, God, give me a dream tonight. In my dream that I had that night, Heather and myself were leaving Kitimat, marching. We, we hit Terrace, and it was just like not even a, a highway, it was a trail. We were pioneering. And we were going through the bush, and I saw about a 100-foot tall outcrop of rocks. I climbed the rocks. Why? In my dream, I knew, I'm like, oh, I'll be able to see the nest. I know. See, that's, you know, that's even in my dreams. But this was a God dream. And this is mine. This is my, this is my burden. This is my burden. This is who I am. This is, and, and I don't apologize. I, and I want to stay faithful to my lane. And, and that's something for you guys. Whatever lane that God has you in, uh, stay faithful. Even if you like that lane, like uh, the first verse I ever memorized in the Bible was Luke 9, 62, which says, he who puts his hand to the plow and looks back is of no use to the kingdom. And the Lord says, this is what he taught me out of it. He goes, you're going to see some plows going that way, and you're going to want to jump on their plow. He goes, don't. Stick on your plow. Just stay straight. Just keep your eyes on me. And so my lane is the prophetic aspect, Bob Jones, the, the promises, to be able to bring forth uh, the mandate of the fulfillment of this well of Kelowna and what's affected all of Canada, et cetera. So I have a dream. I climb the rocks. Me and Heather, I go, come up here. And I get up there first. I go, and I looked. And I, by the way, I've scaled it out. It's 400 miles by the crow flies between Kitimat and Kelowna, just to let you know. And just under. And, uh, and I'm looking in my dream. In my dream, I could see 400 miles. And some of you have heard me talk about a tree, a massive tree like this, that twice when I stepped on stage of New Life where the nest, the mandate is there and stuff. And, you know, I know people say, well, the nest, is, the nest and the mandate is the people. That's true. Sometimes it's not only the people, it's a place. Jerusalem is actually a place, it's a mandate that Jesus, God's not negotiating on. When Jacob had a visitation from God, and he came back to that place, and he met God there again, Jacob's like, oh, this is, this is Bethel. This is the house of God. It was an actual physical place. God likes certain places. He does things in certain places. And so there's a certain spot here in a certain place. I'm not saying that it can't be transferred to another building or whatever. Okay, that's fine. So in my dream, I'm looking, and I look 400 miles away because I've seen this nest before when I step on stage. Massive. I've seen it in 06 and 09. And uh, literally, when I, when I have a vision sometimes, like when I stepped on stage, and if you were there in 09 when I stepped on stage to praise a leader, Ask me to just to step on stage and pray. I'm like, I can do that. I can pray. Yeah. yeah, so they got me. They interrupted the worship service, and I stepped on stage to pray. And we've, I've said this here before, because when Casey was here a year and a half ago, we contended for this very thing. We were contending for the eagle's nest, for that place, etc. In 09, when I stepped on the stage to pray, I stepped on the stage, walked up, and when I turned around, in front of me, a tree shoots up, and I can see it with my eyes. See through, but I can see the whole thing. Wow, it's like big, right up through the roof, just a big with a, and uh, and then two huge snakes, about that round, started going up after after the eagles on the nest. And I, now I stood on stage. I got called up there to pray, and I said, and I started just, I got lost in this vision. I said, I see a tree, and and I see the nest, and I see two huge snakes going up after the eagles, but I see two machetes coming out, swords coming out of the air, and they hit the snakes right behind the head, stick in the tree, the bodies fall down, and I said, two snakes are down, and there's one to go. Now, I was supposed to pray, and I'm giving this whole thing, the whole, and so people are like freaking out, like, and the lady's like, ah, I told you to pray. I'm like, you're right, 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 lost, said, what, just like, and, you know, and everyone's eyes are like this big, sitting down, staring at me. I'm just like, mm, I, and so, uh, 
But I dropped this prayer for the eagle's nest and for everyone that was there. Everyone's crying. There's this mess. 2009, 2014, my dream. Same tree. I can see it in the distance. And I go, look, there it is, Heather. Look, there's the nest. I, and I said, see, right there. And when I looked again, the top one-third of the tree, massive tree, disintegrated. Boom, like the biggest bomb went off. It destroyed the whole nest. It was just gone, took off the third of the top, third of the tree. Boom. And I was so shocked. I was so, so shocked in my spirit, in my dream. Like, oh, no. Like, like something was r ruined forever. Like, I just like, and, and I was just like, and I was just staring. And Heather said, wait, no, there it is. I go, what are you talking about? She goes, look to the right a little bit further down. And I, and I looked, and I'm like, I see dust still, top of a tree, empty. And, but I see the same tree in the distance, and I see a nest on it with an eagle, another eagle coming in. And, I'm like, and in my dream, I was like, I was thoroughly confused. Like, but I, I just saw it get destroyed, but that looks like it. That's a re I, That's. Ten years ago, this morning, as we're here contending for this very mandate, my Facebook memory would pop up. I'm like, oh my gosh. And I was just talking to Cheryl about this yesterday, about this dream. Uh, me, her, and Don took off to JK to Tim. We had lots of time to chat and talk about all this stuff. Uh, anyway, okay, so that was ten years ago. And why is this relevant and why we're here? Partly because... Um, something is shifting for our ministry, for our church, and even for Kelowna. Last October, we were together. We had a conference. I was just a 20-year celebration. We just thought we were going to look at videos and pictures of the last 20 years, and me and Heather and the boys and Kid Matt, and we did none of that. Zero. We didn't even think about that. It was just like, and everyone's like, the mess, the nest, the mandate, eagles, I have dreams. Well, you got to rebuild them. I'm like, oh, well, oh, okay. And just like, yeah, okay. And so I stepped out in faith, started fasting, started dreaming about Kelowna, I know what happens to me when I face what's here and uh, that last large snake, principality. And I'm like, oh, well, I have to face it, you know. And um, so, okay, there's that. I'm going to stop with that because I can get lost for the even. Yeah, I, I got, I got, we're going to blow forward for the next just 20 minutes talking about the apostolic and the prophetic and pastors and fivefold. And uh, you guys all right so far? Yeah, yeah Okay. <clears throat> Apostolic leadership. I'm sorry you don't have these notes, um, and but I'm going to read these out to you. This is we, you've got notes for the seven aspects of the prophetic we you to get to take home. By the way, and if you've signed up for your emails, we will send you. Um, if, if for those who didn't get it because we didn't make enough copies, we'll send you the notes of the seven aspects of the prophetic people and different categories. Apostolic leadership, ready? So we're going <clears> to, <throat> apostolic leadership carries a vision to mobilize the saints to invade, to occupy and transform their communities, their cities. The apostolic thinks kingdom, kingdom before congregation. It aims to send disciples out of the four walls rather than providing programs to keep them in. When I did take over this church six years ago, I said to the leadership, I'm like, um, it's going to be a whole bunch of things that don't get done here. But I'm thinking nation. I, sorry, I'm called. I, if we don't do that, this is dead anyway. And I'm just, I'm not going to die with just an inward focused, nice congregation. I, I'm not doing that. So the stuff that doesn't get done, that no one does, oh, well, I will not die. I'm not going to kill myself over it, and I'm still going to have my hobbies and have fun, and oh, well, because I'm not going, I'm not going to burn out, and I'm not, going to, I'm not going to try and get into the lane that I'm not even built for, okay? Other people have to come in and do those. When apostles lead, people are trained as ambassadors of the kingdom in every sphere of society. Apostolic gatherings are actually springboards for the future. Apostolic gatherings are springboards for the future. So what was here in new life, in the eagle's nest, was an apostolic center that God birthed. 
basically the first one of its kind in the nation of Canada, at least the most famous one. The most far, people came from all over all the time and were literally transformed there. And just boom, okay. Now pastoral. Leadership carries a vision to care for and nurture the lives of the flock. The pastoral thinks needs before nations. And that's good. That's, that's not wrong. It aims to protect the wounded and the broken rather than send them onto the battlefield hurting. Right? You know, and we need, we, if someone comes to me and they're limping, you know, I can't do it, I'll rip that bad leg off. You still got a good leg, let's go. You can just hop, it's just like, just a flesh bones. You don't need two legs. <laughs> when pastors lead, people grow emotionally healthy and learn how to live a balanced, a balanced life. Care for those. Sometimes a balanced life is just means a lot of, uh, uh, just, a equal, just a bit of everything. That's not... That's his balance. I'm like, well, <clears throat> pastoral gatherings are a safe place to heal from the past. And we need that. And we need that. The vision that apostles and prophets carry from the Spirit of God are directed towards the wider universal uh, body of Christ. This is in contrast to shepherds, which are pastors, and teachers who carry vision from the Holy Spirit that is generally directed toward a specific and local gathering of people. Without the vision that apostles and prophets carry, local churches become self-focused, stagnant, and are constantly plagued by tunnel vision. These assemblies primarily become inward-focused over time rather than em empowered to advance the kingdom in their city and region. And by the way, when we talk about a city and region, when we talk about city, region, and nations, most pastors are like, that, that's scary, I can't. Subject my sheep to that, right? And then they get stuck and stagnant and you don't actually train up your people. They stay forever immature because they're actually supposed to be trained for war and to bring the kingdom to, to, to shift their region. If you're a pastor or a teacher and do not acknowledge, and here's, here's something that we're gonna, yeah, here's, here's one of the, ways around having right now pastor-driven, pastor-teacher-led churches. There's, there's a way. If you're a pastor, you're a teacher, and if you don't acknowledge and invite the ministries of the apostles and prophets into your church and community, the vision you have there is too small and you must be expanded upon. You must invite the prophets for they see, and the apostles, for they mobilize, to impart a greater vision and plan of action in your midst. It takes a heart of humility to confess that we as a church need one another. The fivefold ministry must learn how to work together in this hour. In other words, okay, so let's break it down a different way. Right now, our model is a lot of just there's pastor-led churches out there, and they have taken full responsibility. They don't like the prophets or the apostles. And so you stay inward focused. And, and you have, which is not wrong, but you have, but I need to protect. But a lot of your protection, you're protecting your people from what they actually need, what God wants to do. You're hindering the work of the Holy Ghost. And you say, well, I have, I have a, I have a top head guy in, in, in our headquarters, you know, uh, that we submit to. But he just says, well, just do what you want. But the pastor ends up leading and not inviting, not inviting the prophets or the apostles to come and speak into it. You don't trust them. You're supposed to. <clears throat> when, the, when the apostolic and pastoral models, while they carry very different focus and flavor, I declare they're going to be married together in these coming days of the global church. They're going to have to be. 
we're going to see the fivefold ministry actually work together, not against one another. And if you look at Antioch, the model there in Acts 13, uh, when these, because it says there, the prophets, there were prophets and teachers. And the Holy Spirit said, set apart for me, Paul, uh, Saul, and Barnabas for the work of the ministry. That's Acts 13. When we do this, there's going to be an explosion, even here in British Columbia and Canada, when we do this. And if you're a pastor, you're watching, simply invite prophets and apostles, be, in, be a part I'm going to say it like this. Be a part of the RRA. Start to figure it out. Start to watch and listen to the Revival Reformation Reset. Wednesdays at 7. Start to listen and start to say, well, I, I, I like him. I would invite him. Lucier, no. But I'll take Mark. Or I'll do, and that's fine. You don't want me in a family camp. You don't. No. And I, I'm... But there's some people, you know, there's certain ones you want and certain ones you don't. And you know, and you start to, you know, well, I, I'm going to play it safe. Well, that's fine. But, but we're, called to, we're called to walk in faith and in the unknown. And even you don't know it all. And, and, and truth is, if you love your sheep, subject them to the water. And if something, a little bit of wildfire, it's better than the no fire that you have. And then you can actually talk to them in after and like, okay, well, let's discuss this, you know? <clears throat> now, and if you're in a denomination that doesn't even believe in this, you have a problem, and I'm going to tell you again. Get out. I know you don't like that. And it's like, <clears throat> a new era is upon us. We're, we're, yeah, we're going to, simultaneously, we're going to see hospitals for sinners and military bases for saints. And we're going to coexist that's what we're going to establish here. That's what's being established here, right in Kelowna. <clears throat> Underneath one fivefold ministry team, and, and, and this is going to be cities all over the world. We've got a long ways to go, but don't worry, that's fine. It's going to happen. The days of apostles and prophets working together with no pastoral help and teaching grace are over. And the days of teachers and pastors working together with no apostolic or prophetic input are over. These, the days of evangelists feeling like they have no real church family and they've been banished to the streets are over. I believe a new era of the Canadian church has begun. I, I want to throw something else in there, a group that might feel left out. That's the intercessors. When intercessors are not connected to true apostles and prophets, they will grow tired, weary, and disillusioned. Now we have intercessors rising in strength and in happiness and joy because now they don't have to dig so hard prophetically. They get, the prophets are speaking. They're like, ah, oh, it's easier. I'll just take it and pray it through and they're just happy. And also they feel safe and covered by a bunch of apostles that are coming together like Renee McIntyre, Mark Brisbaugh, myself, you know, all these different ones are like, we feel good. We feel safe. And you are. <clears throat> Uh, while many of them who are simply connected to shepherds or pastors will at times become convinced that they're going crazy. That's, see, that's part of the issue too. You go, pastors, they, 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 they're like, if somebody, like intercessors, a little crazy. Prophets too, little, you know, you're just, you're just different. Especially some of, some of the intercessors just like, they're so out there, I'm like, oh my God. <laughs> just like, Praise God for you, but it's just like wing dingy. Um, now, pastors see that, oh my gosh, we can't let you out in public. We can't release you on the rest of the congregation. You got to stay hidden and muzzled and just like, and so they can't even be themselves because the pastor's so sh scared. Shepherd, that's going to freak some people out, but people need freaking out. When I was leading people to Jesus 20 years ago, we, half of our 80 people I led to the Lord in our church, I led to the Lord myself. And we were just like, we were just, and it was just like, just stumbling upon souls. And, and like, I remember we had about six of them brand new in five months. I brought them to the North, I brought them to Toronto Revival. And people go, oh, you can't bring them to the most crazy place on earth, a revival like that. You can't do that. They're gonna like, I, and I, I'm like, 
So they went and they just, they just thought it was normal. This is awesome. Now they don't have to be decommissioned or deprogrammed from a religious bug. They're like, because if, if they don't see any crazy stuff, hear any crazy stuff, they don't have to be crazy themselves. But if we allow the crazy ones to just manifest and speak and just be themselves, you know, and maybe they're like, well, I, it's not me, but great. And then they don't, because if you don't show, if none, of, if none of your people are ever subjected to the movement of the Holy Ghost, and if you study out revival, hey, it's all through history. When God shows up, it's, 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 it's a gong show. And, and it all looks different. It's a, just a gong show. I love this story. I've said it here before. I'll say it again. 200 years ago in the Cambridge Revival, you know, all the, the, the women showed up with all their hairs in a bun and all that stuff, and just like all prim and proper. The Holy Ghost hit them so hard, their, their hair came out long, and they're just like, and they're like Stacey Campbell. And they're just, their hair is going back and forth so fast, it's cracking like a horse whip. The reason a horse whip cracks is because that end, when it comes out, goes back, and it comes back so fast, it breaks the speed of sound. It's the sound barrier, and you get a crack. The hair was cracking, breaking the speed of sound. Some guy mocked them, says, he shook his head mocking these ladies. He shook his head, he broke his neck, died right in front of everyone. There's lots of weird stuff, lots of incredible manifestations. I mean, when it hit in 1906 in Azusa Street, people were lying, like, lying dead for 12 hours, like dead, like just in the hay, in, in this horse barn. That's where it fell on Azusa Street. It was a, it was a horse stall because a, bl a black man, you couldn't rent much to him back in the days mixed congregation. It was illegal, really, to mix, meet together and stuff. So they rented a, a, a horse stall. Fire of God fell there. People would show up, sometimes lay dead for two days. Just out. And, and just like it. So anyway, I brought them to Toronto and they just thought dude, everything after that was just tame. And they're just like, this is great. It was just like, well, you know, okay. <clears throat> but pastors are scared don't be scared. Let it fly. Let it move. Worst case scenario, it's a demon manifesting in the front under the, because of the presence of God. Great! What a great place to have it. Like, And, and even when you read the book Religious Affections by Jonathan in, in the Wales Revival, Jonathan Welsh, the Welsh Revival, what's his name? Jonathan Edwards, he wrote a book. Just like um, studying revivals of the past, what he said was, if somebody's freaking out or manifesting, that doesn't mean it's of God. Doesn't mean it's not. You don't know, and you don't judge it. Don't judge it. Don't judge it. Wait for the fruit, because you just don't know. Because God likes to do stuff that is out of your wheelhouse. And the thing is, pastors, if you have an arrogance about you, it'll be proven because you'll say God doesn't do that. Because you have God all figured out, right? No, you don't. I dare you to study the revivals of the past. Most intercessors are familiar with giving the word of the Lord to their pastor, but never really felt, but have never really been led by apostles and prophets who give them the word of the Lord. Intercessors help advance the plans and purposes of God by standing in the gap declaring the word of the Lord. They also help to mobilize and put into motion the promises of God by stirring up communities of believers to wake up and get involved. This is very needed. Very needed. And we love you, intercessors. We love you, on the, uh, those on the firewall, so on and so forth. And here's something, I don't know, I read this out a couple weeks, a few months ago, but I just I wrote down. The true apostolic is not a professional hierarchy of polished ministers who belong to a good old boys club, bringing their judgmental gavels down and out of the box moves of God or kingdom realities that threaten their denominational cows. The apostolic... Our mothers and fathers, guardians and gatekeepers of the family of God locally and at large, the protective and the wise ones, true elders. The apostolic ecclesia is the family of God defined 
And it is this family that is, that is and will restore everything that religion has defiled. The spirit of religion, I'm just saying it like this, we're coming for you. Oh yeah. The word of God is very clear. Resist the devil, he will flee. We're gonna resist you. You watch what happens, spirit of religion. You watch what happens. God's gonna flatten you. And by the way, those who cling on to it will be flattened as well. So, you, so re reject that. The true apostolic in this hour will build family. It will repair family. It will fight for the family. That's what the apostolic is. <clears throat> okay. Um, we need to, we need to, oh, we need to move on here. Um, yeah. Just something about the religious spirit. The religious spirit, uh, here's some of the things that the religious spirit hates. Here's a checklist for you. The anointing. Doesn't like that. Prophetic ministry and prophets. Authentic deliverance. Miracles, signs, and wonders. New Testament church leadership and governance. Freedom and joy. Go figure. Down the line. You're not allowed to be sing like that. We dance. Not allowed to dance in church. My goodness. <clears throat> they don't like uh, the religious spirit. Doesn't like teaching on the goodness of God. Teaching on provision and abundance. Teaching on the gifts of the spirit. Teaching on freedom in Christ. Teaching on sonship. The religious spirit does not like anything that challenges their stagnation. And lethargy, their lethargicness. Don't challenge someone's lethargicness. <clears throat> so I just say, let's keep giving the religious demons a nervous breakdown. <laughs> okay. I'm going to wrap up here with this word. This is a lo long we're going to blow through this. This is an incredible word from Krista Elisha from November 14th. The release of the ironclad apostolic oxen. I heard, oh, on the, on the morning of the first of Kislev, or November 14th, 2023, I heard the Spirit of the Lord say, I'm releasing my ironclad oxen. Suddenly I went into a vision where I saw teams of oxen adorning and shining, adorned in shining armor. Oxen, their horns dripping with fresh golden oil, bucking at the hard ground on the edge of a battlefield. The battlefield itself was ominous, a wild wasteland overgrown with thorns and thistles. Hot breath excitedly billowed from the nostrils of the ironclad oxen as they looked over the horizon, imagining the future and dreaming with the Lord about the land's potential. The uncharted territory ahead seemed to call them, compelling them to go low, of all they had known previously while simultaneously drawing them into uh, unknown, the unknown frontier. They were undaunted at the prospect of having no physical path or navigation equipment to follow because the light of the bright and morning star was lifted up within their hearts and guided, were guiding their way. They carried uncommon faith in the prophetic and had written words of God given them specifically for this moment of, in history. They had, le leaned, le they had learned in previous seasons how to make war with the prophecies concerning them, right? That's 1 Timothy 1.18, what does that say? Fight the good fight of faith by the word of prophecy spoken concerning you. <clears throat> they were men and women of action carrying the Lord's burden to see cities, nations, uh, regions, and generations restored. The Lord has been preparing this new breed of wild apostolic oxen who are marked by grit and grace. Up until now, they've been the hidden ones who were in a process with the Lord as he has crushed them under the pressure of his lordship uh, uh, on, through spiritual combat and relational conflicts. This has not been punishment, but establishment which was necessary for them to be conformed to the character of Christ that they may be entrusted 
with the power and authority required for their massive mission. They have learned to submit to God's will, God's way, God's voice, yoking them to his strength in the wilderness. This intense training with the Holy Ghost now has them ready to carry the weight of his glory into open spaces and marketplaces. This rare breed grows bored with monotony but thrives in the midst of adversity. If, if, if they're bored and there's no fight, they'll just go pick one. Right. Braveheart. I'm going to go pick a fight. <laughs> and then the buddy, remember when Braveheart goes and tells the, tells the, uh, the whatever the English elders there, just like, I won't repeat what he said, but he goaded them. And the other guy says, looks like we didn't get dressed for nothing. These are the ones that just go pick a fight with the enemy. <clears throat> they actually need the challenging work in the form of pioneering adventure in opposition to plow through. Forward momentum is the only option these are they who have forsaken their own lives. Instead, lay a hold of the plow, never looking back. For their gaze is fixed ahead on Christ and his call. Their heart burns to see God's kingdom come and his will to be done on earth as it is in heaven. They are spiritual architects entrusted with heavenly blueprints for this era. Unfortunately, I do see the assignment of the enemy. It, it, it is to get those in the family of faith to misunderstand and misinterpret this new breed of groundbreakers and atmosphere shifters. These apostles are, gift with, are being gifted with eyes to see outside the traditional boxes and structures where much of the Western church has been held captive. They plow, build, and plant from glory, not from the options and suggestions of men. And they will be subject to much slander and accusation from the religious spirit for stepping into uncharted territory. Many conservatives, much of those of these apostles, will embark on, uh, uh, embark on and the demographic of individuals they will be called to minister to will be extremely offended. Many conservatives with these apostles, they'll be very offended. The religious spirit will try uh, and to make them appear to be compromised by worldly things. But make no mistake, they are a class of holy ones marked and set apart for such a time as this. They are the sent ones called to the world as undercover agents on, a, on assignment to overthrow demonic thrones. They are to cut, to cut down uh, uh, idol altars and destroy evil systems. They are absolutely not of the world, their ministry model is like Jesus who dined with sinners yet did not sin, leading many to righteousness without compromising their faith. I just want to say something here. I know this came to mind. I don't know if I mentioned it a month ago. When I went to Bible college for one semester, and I just, it, was just, it was just so, it was stealing my, my faith. And I got to know people, and everyone's like, you're going to be the best PAOC minister ever. Blah, blah. And I just like, and I just, and I just backed out. And, and so many of them were in Bible college, never called. They were given pastoral positions, never called to ministry. They don't even have, they, they just, they're doing this business. That's their job, to be a pastor, and just like to keep everyone happy and to make sure there's no wildfire. These are the very ones who, who spread word gossip about me. Don't go to any of Lucier's meetings. Don't go to North Battleford. One of my Bible college friends she showed up in North Battleford. For one night, she just showed, showed up. She goes, so like, uh, this is pretty freaky. But this is amazing. Just to let you know, though, they sent a word out to all of our friends, don't go to Art Lucy stuff. I said, yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. See, and that's not gossiping about people. That's calling a system down. You can be very indignant and angry about policies, but don't go personally attacking a person or a prime minister. Don't do that. You set yourself up in the seat of the accuser. But, be, but rather stand up against the policies. 
what we're doing as Christians, this is what we do. We'll sit back in our bedrooms or in our rooms and we'll gossip, we'll, we'll slander the prime minister, but when it comes to actually kind of stand against policies, we're silent. It's supposed to be the other way around. You're actually supposed to make a stand in the public square for what's right, what, what's right and ignore, ignore him. Just ignore him. He's just used a pawn of the devil on his way to hell. That's all he is. He's on his way. He's just a pawn on his way to hell. Pray for him. God save that man. Just like, doesn't help when you uh, join the accuser. No. <clears throat> Their ministry models like Jesus who dined with sinners. Yeah, I read that. Despite the smear campaigns launched against them in a similar fashion as Nehemiah, who was harassed by Tobias and Sanballat, these apostolic builders will not be moved or distracted from their assignment. Instead, the demonic chatter will be an indicator that they are, in fact, right in the center of God's will, spurring them to build on with even greater fervor to complete the mission. I don't know if I'm speaking to anyone here, but tonight I'm just like speaking to myself. I like this word. This is like pretty crazy. It's like, it's good. Holy Spirit is now downloading the new era wineskin blueprints to this new breed of wild oxen. In the days ahead, we will see them build strange and unusual structures never seen before in church history. These structures will be equipped with innovative technology to aid the ecclesia. They will not only be given jurisdiction to de disciple and govern regions, but also reach the harvest of souls. These numerous souls are the ones who will never step foot in a Western church building, but they're, but they're currently hanging in the balance. Currently now. This is why there's no time to waste. There has been much confusion around the office of the shepherd and the office of the apostle. Here's a little explanation between their functions because it's, it's important to know they are not the same as we've already looked at. When a region is hard-pressed, the Lord sends the anointing of the wild apostolic ox in partnership with the prophet to plow, break, uproot, tear down, and make the way for the new. To make way for the new. Where the local shepherd or pastor sees congregational needs, the apostle sees the needs of the nations. Shepherds are moved in compassion to meet the needs of individuals. Apostles are moved to build with the Holy Ghost what is necessary to meet the needs of cities and nations. The shepherd's goal is to cultivate an atmosphere of love, giving us a safe place to heal from our past where everyone belongs in the family of God. The apostle's goal is to shift the spiritual climate over regions uh, to the atmosphere of heaven, where God's government brings order, righteousness, prosperity, and justice. Where shepherds seek to disciple individuals and congregations to produce the fruits of the Spirit, apostles seek to disciple nations, cities, equipping and sending out individuals en masse to multiply that, that, that fruit coupled by their own gifts of the Spirit to integrate and demonstrate kingdom values in their own spheres of influence. Shepherds cultivate kingdom culture in congregations, or supposed to, resulting in families conforming to the culture of heaven, while apostles inspire believers to cultivate kingdom culture in every area of society, resulting in cities and conforming to the culture of heaven. Apostles organize and prepare a supernatural army for cultural conquest created for kingdom purposes with a God-given destiny that demands their attention and action. Shepherds function as supernatural medics, nurses, physicians, healing the brokenhearted, binding up wounded warriors, and teaching them in the process how to lovingly care for others who are lost and hurting. Almost done. Church. We must be careful not to force the apostles in our midst to wear the shepherd's garb. We need both in operation along with the rest of the fivefold offices working in tandem moving forward. When there is only a shepherd's anointing in operation, the sheep become fat and comfortable in their pews while the enemy overruns their city. We're going to hit that which holds this city in bondage head on. It's our call. 
We're not supposed to be just in a box saying, well, they're so bad out there and have our own culture kind of we're paralleling there. We're actually supposed to go out and T-bone the culture. We're supposed to T-bone it. God, I'm, I'm telling you. <clears throat> Where there's only a shepherd's anointing in operation, the sheep become fat. We look, da, da, da. Um, this may appear to be fine until the enemy starts picking off the young and feeble among them who wander too close to the edge of the grazing grounds. The job of the apostle is that of a military general, spiritual architect, kingdom builder. They remind the lambs that they are lions and inspire them to action. They equip them with the right spiritual weapons, building materials, and send them out with a mandate to rebuild the ancient ruins and repair the desolations of generations, bringing heaven to earth. When the anointing of the apostle works with a shepherd, the believers are spiritually fed, fipped, equipped, and transformed to, to transform the world around them. I would ask God to convict every congregational leader to study, teach, and provide a space for all five ministry offices to pour into their people. A resurgence of importance of the fivefold offices and proper recognition of who walks in those offices are paramount to what God is doing in this hour. Well, I should stop there on the fivefold. That's that's good for tonight. Um, yeah, thank you, Lord, for truth in your word. As far as that goes, yeah, yeah. You guys okay? Yeah, you yeah, all right? Good. I, uh, I gave away my copy. Um, I think I've got another one here. Let's see, in my notes. Um, boom. Okay, now, as we get over to the, over to the prophetic, I, I have to read something to you. I'm going to, I sat down for a couple weeks ago for about 30 minutes because people were asking me, so, this, uh, these nests around Canada, what does it look like? What do we do? So I sat down for 30 minutes, and here's what I wrote, and I'm giving it to you guys. I'm sorry I don't have this on the notes here and stuff, but there's seven aspects of vision because this is what's happening. This nest is being restored. The apostolic center is being restored. We're going to connect within a whole bunch of you all over the place, and, and right across the nation, there's mothers and fathers uh, prophetic ones who are going to lead nests, their families, just as we have a firewall family for intercessors, now there's going to be an alliance of prophets who are going to train up eaglets because we can all hear. We can all hear the voice of God. And so here's the vision for the nests um, for the Canadian Prophets Alliance. Here we go. Seven points. Blow through them quick. And we'll, we will send you these as well. And we're going to be, you know, we're working at Bringing this forward takes time. Did have an incredible meeting the other day, 90-minute meeting preliminary with a bunch of different leaders, Wendy Lee, Casey, you know. Uh, Sammy jumped on there and goes, this is so needed. We need to build this. Number one, the vision. To see prophetic regional nests form and arise. There's one forming here. They're going to form in different places. We're going to bring, train you in the word of the Lord. And God's going to speak to some of you, and we're going to actually, the word's going, we're not, some of you are going to be trained up for the marketplace, for the streets, for in church, for your family, uh, boldness, the word of the Lord, how to hear, how to bring forward words of knowledge, lay hands on some of you for dreams, visions. Um, at the same time, though, laying hands only goes so far. Uh, has to be your hunger. <clears throat> Number two, to connect with other existing nests and companies around Canada, a family. Number three, to, a train, to equip, train, and sharpen the prophets of Canada. Number four, to make room for the new and younger generation of prophets. Number five, to bring forth both regional and national prophetic families. Number six, to bring forth the word of the Lord and the ways of the Lord to all regions of Canada. Number seven, to normalize and embrace the prophetic gifts in the kingdom of God. Okay? And how do we implement this? Quickly, I'm going to blow through ten points implementation, even for here and for those who might be listening. Recognize and establish, um, establish potential nest leaders. This is more for the nation, so listen up. Recognize nest leaders, ones out there who are listening to my voice, and maybe you want to gather 
you know, and make a nest, a, a prophetic nest, connected in with this alliance. Connect and empower these prophetic fathers and mothers. Encourage and equip leaders in, this new, in a new wineskin. Number four, establish regional families and nests via texting, social apps, and media. Zoom, have monthly Zoom and or in-person regional gatherings. Number six, have quarterly, every three months, nest leaders connection with Zoom. Nest, we're going to connect all these nest leaders like, hey, what's going on in your nest? What's going, what's going on? What do you need? What are the prophets saying? And then have, have quarterly national Zoom calls with all eagles. Anyone who's connected in with these, we do a quarterly national Zoom with different national prophets just to speak and encourage you and do some teaching. <clears throat> in person, number eight, in person schools and prophetic training around the nation. In person, gather, going to your regions. Number nine, have an annual national in person gathering. <clears throat> And the first one will be this Thanksgiving. Here. Yeah. We're going to do a national gathering for the Alliance. In fact, we need you because we have discerned, some of us, I talked to Barry about it today, talked to uh, Chris Mathis the other day. Um, we're, we're, gonna, we're going to make a stand. We're going to do a battle for Canada here. Again. This time it's going to be a little different. Where it's going to be a little, it's going to be a little better, you know, and um, we're going to anyway. Um, <clears throat> uh, number ten, bring forth the word of the Lord when and where needed. All right. Okay, are you guys are you guys good? Okay, yeah, I already asked that. All right. Okay, we're going to switch. To, oh man, look at that, February two, twenty twenty. That's hilarious. Okay. Um, <clears throat> do you need to stretch? Do you need to stand up? Do you... So yeah, I, okay. I will. I will speak about this as well. Um, as you know, last year, uh, last year, uh, in in the spring, I said, "Hey, everyone, I believe I see that God's going to give us another building." I said, I, I might not be till the fall, but I know something is coming. The fall came, no building. I was like, ooh, I missed that. Ooh, I missed that. I'm like, wow, what's going on? December 22nd, I would meet with a man who owns a building here who didn't like me. <laughs> now he likes me. And so he has a building that we're going to go do a meet and greet in next Friday at 7 o'clock. Next Friday, 7 o'clock, I want you to bring goodies, and we're going to go to a new building. And uh, it's at 2041 Main Street. It's called Main Street Market. That's the original name. Okay, Main Street Market. Yeah, so we're going to go there, bring some goodies, and we've got some good news there for you. I'll just say. And in that location, we're going to do uh, a prophetic gathering. People are going to come from all over the place. And we're going to have a wonderful time on March 21st, first day of spring, for, for, for like 21st, 22nd, 23rd, and even a Sunday morning on March 24th. And uh, we've got people coming from all over for that, for that gathering. And it's kind of going to be like a battle for Canada, except a fun one, in that there's no scheduled speakers. We're just believe when you get together, have worship, but then there's an open mic and there's a bunch of prophets, preachers, and apostles in the house. You know, I'm sure the word of the Lord will come forward. Okay, so yeah, stay tuned for that. Okay, here we go. Seven expressions of the prophetic spirit. <clears throat> Gonna do a little, yeah, all right. <laughs> Let's see if this does like this. Mm hmm. Now, the prophetic spirit can be expressed in various and different ways, of course. Let's take a look at the seven expressions, seven of them. Number one, dreams and visions, or the seer. Purpose for the seer. 
Awakens God people to the realm of the Holy Spirit, ministry of angels, etc. Number two, creativity. Creatively illumines the truth of God's word and his ways. Confer, number three, confirms direction God has given others. Number four, is, it, is, um, um, it is miraculous and elevates our faith level and belief in God for his personal and corporate purposes to be fulfilled. Uh, a biblical example is Zechariah 4, 1 to 6, where Zechariah saw um, this, these, these double lampstand and the oil flowing down, so on and so forth, okay? Um, contemporary examples are Paul Cain, Bob Jones, Jill Austin, many others' examples are of this type of vessel, or it used to be, they're gone now. These individuals could have a combination of power, prophecy, personal ministry, impact, impartation, they operate primarily out of a seer dimension. Okay, number two. Proclamation of God's corporate purpose. By the way, I took this from another Kansas City prophet, um, um, James Gall. <clears throat> number two. Uh, uh, another type is a, to uh, proclaim God's corporate purpose. Purpose gives clarity to the overall direction and purpose of the body of Christ. Enables the body to reach full maturity in Christ. They often operate in the gift of sterlings and sons of Issachar, so they interpret to us a big picture of what the Holy Spirit is saying. Kind of like Acts 13, where there's prophets and teachers. Paul is only a missionary at the time. And all of a sudden, it says, The Holy Spirit said, Set apart for me Saul and Barnabas. The Holy Spirit said, did he speak out of thin air? No, he spoke by a proclaiming prophet. We welcome those here. You have to, you have to be trusted. You got to be healed up. Walking righteously. Okay? Because we, you know, you need to be kind of a pure, pure if you're going to be that kind of vessel. Because <clears throat> Paul actually moved away after that. That's a, that's a directive word. That's New Testament. We need those still here today. A lot of people are stuck in the same place because there's no proclaiming prophets anymore. And if you talk to the pastor and the pastor, I feel led, oh no, just stay here, brother. Pastor doesn't want to lose anyone. I want to attend the sheep. This is, my, this is my family. It's like, you know, <clears throat> it's not wrong. We just need the prophets as well, obviously. <clears throat> Number three, proclamation of God's heart and standards for his people. Purpose. This calls for holy thoughts, intentions, motives for individuals, ministries, and churches. Ushers in the fruit of the Holy Ghost, the character of Christ, purity and holiness. Releases the standards for the family, fatherhood of God, etc. Biblical examples is Moses when he, he called for that golden calf to be ground to dust. When he brought forth the Ten Commandments, Isaiah, with his experience of coals and fire cleansing him from the uncleanness and preparing him for the Lord. Number three, John the Baptist preached the message of repentance as a forerunner of preparing the way of Jesus. So this is another aspect of the prophetic, okay? We need those holy ones. It's not just about all nice stuff. Well, I just believe in exhortation, comfort, and in, you know, edification. It's like, yeah, we'll need, sometimes we need our butts kicked. Sometimes you do. We need some things exposed, right? <clears throat> yeah, we do. <clears throat> and let's go to number four. Proclamation of God's church. Church's social responsibilities and actions. Mm -hmm. Purpose. Um, <clears throat> that at first, that it calls the church to care for the widow, the orphan, the poor, the oppressed, the prisoner. Mm -hmm. Calls it into being, calls it in being, into being the Lord's justice and in an unjust society. Righteousness. Um, oh, that's some weird spelling in there when I transferred this over. That's so weird. Um, righteousness is a torch that the broken and compassionate broken vessels carry. I don't know how it's... Um, they, they're righteous ones and they just like, they're really sensitive. You know, they're the ones that say, well, I can't watch Lord of the Rings because it's got weird stuff. Okay, wonderful. But that, that's them. They're wired differently. It's like, you know, I can't watch TV. I'm great, you know. 
while some of you, some of us can watch a show and, you know, watch a movie and, you know, they let some F-words go. It's like, no, nah, maybe we should be bothered more. I don't know. But these ones, like, Wah! they run out. It's like, what? <laughs> what, what? What's going on? It's just like, and because they just, because they need to be cleaner vessels. Because they're bothered by that. They're really bothered. Okay? But at the same time, they've got some real weaknesses in other places. But they're, they're just a type of, they're a type of prophet. Okay? It's like... <clears throat> um, and biblical examples are Amos and James in the New Test. Uh, uh, okay, and in, in the New Testament, show me your faith by your works. Okay, contemporary examples. I'm going to skip that. Number five, speaking forth the administrative strategy of God, even with a political slant. Purpose, wise and smooth implementation of God's purposes. Provision released during difficult hours. Moves into the spirit of counsel for those in authority. Wow, yes. Yeah, we need them. Biblical example. Joseph in the Old Testament brought, into, brought in the strategy of economic, of economic proportions, wielding together a relative, revelatory and administrative giftings. Yeah, he says this is what you're going to do. Take seven years and gather lots of food because the seven years are after that are going to be like Famine. And so he served the king and he was able to save a nation. All right. Um, Agabus in the book of Acts declared a famine that was coming and called for the necessary plans and provisions to be made. We like that. We want those, you know, and this is, we, 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 we want to hear. Um, <clears throat> contemporary examples, well, I'm going to skip that. Number six. Prophetic worship leaders who usher in the manifested presence of God through prophetic worship. Purpose, to release people into liberty to both express and receive God's love. Number two, the gifts of the Holy Spirit are easily received and released in such an atmosphere. Mm -hmm. Number two, spiritual warfare often takes place as high praise, defeating the works of the enemy. This is, a very, this is, this is needed. We want to see that even more. I like to take song leaders and make them worship leaders. A lot of people can lead a song. They can't lead worship. They can't usher in. And it's a, it's a certain atlas, you know. Even as we talk about this stuff, it says eagerly desire the greater gifts, especially you, pro you would prophesy. Yeah, there is. I felt, I'm going to just stop here for a sec. Quickly, a little bit more of my journey, for those who, who may not know, just... Uh, but I, you know, saved in 1988 in, in a religious church for the most part. Of course, I came out of a very religious church, and I thought this one was on fire compared to, and maybe it was to a degree and stuff, but it was interesting, though. It's just like, because I was just so on fire, and the elder, the elder told me, he goes, you're quite on fire, hey, son? I said, yeah. He goes, don't worry, soon you'll be like us. All right. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, me and Heather moved away, you know, uh, 88, I got saved, and then we got married December 91, moved away in 92, five years down south, and, 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 it, and kind of lukewarm churches, of course, and, and when you're in, like, say, your Baptist or your Alliance or your Pentecostal, when you move somewhere, you don't look for anything else except your brand. So I, we just found our brand, and it was just dead. And just so, I really, I really struggled to keep the fire, you know, and, and I came to a place where, like, I, I'm not good. I'm just not good. And, and five years into that, I, I, the Lord says, uh, he goes, will you go where I send you? I said, I will. He goes, good, because I'm going to bring revival where you go then. And then we, we went to Kidmat, which I didn't want to go, the last place, but we went there for 21 years. That's where Heather came from. Heather said, I'll do anything for God except there. Move it. <laughs> Bad. It's like I, I, it was, yeah, I didn't want to go. But when I went there in 97, when I went there, all of a sudden, uh, a new gift of prophecy awoke in me. I could see things happening, coming to pass. I'm like, I could see, I knew what God wanted to do, and I would contend for them. Like, um, there's a saying if you can see it, you can have it. So that's a type of, of finding out the will of God for your life. If God gives you a vision 
And sometimes you'll get them during your, your prayer time or your reading or spending time with the Lord. And you're like, oh, I'm distracted. The Lord's like, no, you're not distracted. I'm talking to you. <laughs> and I'm showing you something for your future. Now I'm showing you, I can't do it for you. But if you go for it, I give you permission because I'm showing you what the potential is. Prophecy is potential. There's a lot of things that are supposed to happen in our lives that don't and never will. Because we're in control. It's called free will. So if you spend time with the Lord and you're seeking the Lord, he will show you things. You might see, it's like, for a lot of you, that is, that is permission. But you gotta, you gotta go for it. So when I see something, I go for it. It's like I have permission. And that awoken me because I moved to a place I didn't want to move to in 97. And it just started to increase. And me and Heather had known each other, you know, now for 10 years because we started dating in, in, in 89. Okay, maybe not. Yeah, so we had known each other eight years, something like that. And, and, uh, and this new prophetic awoke in me, and she wasn't used to it. She's like, what? So I said, no, I see this. We're supposed to do this. She goes, that's not going to happen. I said, well, I, let's go for it. One of the things was I saw the two former splits of that Pentecostal church in Kinemet coming together. I said, we're supposed to do this. We're supposed to invite them. She goes, they will not come. I said, well, let's do it. That little church of 80 people, that night that we did it, had 250 people, packed. We had 52 songs, our team. 52 songs. And I made a team between the two churches because I was new there, so I wasn't hated yet. So we made 52 songs. All we did was sing 52 songs while the Holy Spirit moved, and I just watched an amazing thing. Actually, there were three splits that came together. And, and Heather's like, you saw this? I said, I did. And I would start to see things. She's like, well, it took years. It took years for Heather to trust me. You know, and so same with a lot of people who doubt you, the ones closest to you. You just got, and that's part of the test. You just keep going. <clears throat> and so every time I've been obedient, I've increased. A little test is like, well, you, it's like a test. And when I've stepped out in faith, and just, you know. Um, <clears throat> okay, let's go on. We're going to go to number six, prophetic worship. We're already there. Yeah, right, 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 right. Okay, prophetic foundations under prophetic worship. Number six, B, biblical example. David played his harp and demons departed. Oh. Oh, and that was something else that happened. When I would be obedient, I would grab my guitar and people would start to weep or things would happen. I'm like, what's going on? It's actually a gifting and God moves through you even through your voice and through your instruments. I know that's not for everyone. You know, not everyone can be a musician. Heather was sharing about how she would play music in the theater and she would hear stuff. This happened to me one day when I'm at my kitchen table in about the year 2000, and I'm practicing my worship for a song set, and I'm playing, and I could hear this keyboard. I'm like, why? What? I can hear something. And so I stop, and I thought I heard something. I'm like, that's weird. I swear I could hear a keyboard playing some more other instruments, just like. So I started doing it, and I could hear, and I'm worship. So I was just, I stopped really fast, and the music played for about another half second. We, huh? I got you. <laughs> Seriously. So awesome that heaven worships with us. And this is a gift in the Word of God. <clears throat> Miriam <laughs> changed the desert into a dancing floor. When they crossed, the, when they came out of the, through the Red Sea, Deborah and Barak sung forth the prophetic word, Judges 5. Contemporary examples, Jason Upton, Misty Edwards, Ken Henry, Rob Stearns, Joan McFadder, and others. Anyway. Number seven, prophetic intercession. Purpose, receives the burden of God and releases intercession. 
which can be a, a, which can affect international affairs, particularly political burdens. Kneels on the revealed promises and prays the prophetic the prophetic end to be. Prays an end to be. Number three, these are often crisis intercessors who are landed on by the Holy Spirit for individual and corporate emergency situations. Biblical examples, Daniel's prayer three times a day for God's sovereign purposes with Israel and her release from Babylon captivity. That guy prayed for 70 years three times a day. 70 years three times a day. And by the way, not all intercessors are prophetic. But every prophetic person is an intercessor. You must be. It'll help. Actually, um, your gift will flourish as you go into intercession, actually. Anna, in the temple, New Testament model, prepared, prepared the way for the Messiah to come through her ministry of prayer and fasting. I, I don't know. I think she was in there how many years? She was, what, 84? Something like that. And she was like young when she became a widow. She spent 60 years in the, in the temple, fasting and praying, waiting for that day. Yeah, yeah. We have a different concept of like, we're now in an instant potato society. Like me having a dream of the eagle's nest and seeing something come to pass. Be, and something about the kingdom of God and your destiny. Don't just look at the end goal and say, I'll be excited when that happens. The journey from here to there is what grows you to actually walk in that when you get there. If you short circuit your journey with the Lord and don't put in today's work and today's excitement in the, in the Lord and in the word and just face the demons and the, and the issues of the day, you will not be ready for that. You not, will not be ready for that. God, some, he show, sometimes he shouldn't show us. He, does, he shows us a bit, but man, he... If you could short circuit to get there, you would, but you will not be ready for that day. Something's just about to happen for us, our ministry, in the restoration of the eagle's nest, where we're going and where we're going to start worshiping, et cetera, et cetera. And what's going to happen, um, 20 years ago, maybe I thought I'd be ready. Oh, I was not. I, st I'm, I don't know that I'm ready. Everything I do, I, I'm just drowning a little bit. Like, <sighs> just like, just like, just, and I just get comfortable. All of a sudden, I go into deeper water. <sighs> I just, I'm just, <sighs> just drowning. I tell you, it's just. Uh, <clears throat> Esther declared a fast in times of crisis. Wow. Saving her people from annihilation. And of course, some contemporary examples are people there. Uh, <clears throat> I've got another set of 10 stuff that I was going to talk about. about the perfect I'm not going to. Go. I, I didn't know where this was going to land. At least I had my some notes this time. And um, but what I what I would uh, like to do, I would I'd like to field some questions. I thought about that earlier today. It was like so. There's time if if you guys have any thoughts on the prophetic or on the fivefold or where we're going. I will I will field some questions. So um, you can just stand up, shout it out, and I'll repeat it because we don't have two mics. Yeah. If someone has a question, I'll just repeat it for those at home. Yeah, go ahead. Chris Valentin talking about the Eagles Nest. No, I'm not. Um, I'm not aware that he was. I'm aware that Todd Bentley is. 
like ridiculously sharp and accurate. Just like, well, what's going on? Um, somebody in Ontario that, because Todd, me and Todd, I used to be a Fresh Fire Church back in the day in Kitimat until he went sideways. And uh, now he's on his way back. And, and, um, and, and he's accurate and clear with his words, but somebody that I know quite well was in his meeting. And they're like, he was talking about Kelowna and the Eagle's Nest for half his talk tonight. What's going on? I'm like, what? So I listened to the message, like, holy moly. And so I reposted. And if you, if, if, you know, um, I know that Todd, yeah, um, has gone through some stuff and has had some, to figure out some things. I also know he just turned 48, and there's a prophetic word that come, came out that when he's 50, he's just going to step back into an anointing, and he's going to be an end-time harvester. I, I pray that that actually, you know, happens. Um, and, uh, uh, but his spirit was, and his clarity was untouched of how he ministers that way. But anyway, yeah, thanks for that. I know it's, it's really a time um, about, about the eagle's nest being restored, and, um, and a new breed of, in this, of wartime prophets. Yeah, wartime prophets coming forward. And um, not just being, um, this is why we need the fivefold, because the pastors are scared to let them loose. Scared to hear from them. And, 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 and about this eagle's nest, and I know that some of you have received training and prophetic in schools back in the day. And Karen and Steve have said, we need you to do this three-hour course as you come into this and something like, I don't want to do that. It's like we just just do it. Don't, don't be dumb. We need you to do that. Just get in there. Cause so so here's the deal. I had a I had a revelation. I had a revelation this week about a scripture verse. And I'm like, oh my gosh, I never saw that before. The Lord just like do you see? So what it says in one of the most um, power packed scriptures chapters on the prophetic and the order of it is 1 Corinthians 14. In it, it says, two or three prophets should speak and the rest should weigh it. And I always thought, well, that's let the prophet speak in church and the rest should weigh it. No, no, no. Don't let pastors weigh a prophetic word. No. No. It's just like, no. The rest should weigh it. The rest of the prophets. Yeah, 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 yeah. And just like, I was like, I've seen that with more clarity. That's why you need the nest. That's why you need prophetic families and groups to get together, all you weird ones, and all the ones that hear and just get trained, and then the prophets should speak, and the rest of oh, yeah, yeah, okay, you know, and then it moves up the line, moves up the ladder as far as the word. Anyway, uh, next, if you a question or thought, anyone? No, we're good. Just. Uh, Yeah, Christine. So you talked about um, uh, national civil servants and all the world gathering and doing a lot of things. So you went into the store. Okay, good. So um, um, a national leader got a hold of me and said, oh, what, I heard that you're kicking up a new prophetic alliance on, like this March. Like, no, no, no. We're, we're, we've, we've had two pre preliminary, we've had two Zoom calls with some leaders, um, some prophets, and they're excited. Um, it's going to take a while to roll out. Um, as you know, I was simply being obedient here in this house. That's why we kicked up the Kelowna Prophetic Company that already existed, and, uh, and, and I didn't know. And so, um, you know, this is, this is, this is connected in with the RRA and the harvest. This is the nest for the harvest. Um, it's, it's, um, and, and the RRA, which is the Revival Reformation Alliance, it's connected in with apostles and prophets there. But just as the firewall is connected into the RRA, and it's the intercessory arm, so the prophetic alliance, prophets alliance, will be the prophet's arm of, of the, uh, and, and so, we just have to build it, and we need an eighth day in the week. And, um, and other leaders, it just takes time. We're going to work on it. You know, the firewall we built in eight, six weeks. This is not going to be that. There's protocols. There's different ones in place, and profits are funnier <laughs> to work with. 
And, and so, um, but, in, but in any case, it's, it's here in this house. Um, it is being built, and uh, Karen and Steve Horton are going to be running, fathers of the, mother and father of the nest, per se. With, I'm, I'm the apostolic overseer. Come in, and they're going to be training, and we're, we're going to be teaching the basics. They're going to be teaching the basics, and then we're going to be doing schools for the mediums and even high-level stuff, bringing different ones in uh, in time. Yeah, so just it's going to, it's taking some time, but we are for, for the nation, yeah. Any other thoughts and questions about the fivefold or the prophetic or anything else? Is there... Stephanie might have one. Maybe. Okay. Okay. Okay, you know what? I can comment on that, even on the ketosis, because it's an aspect of fasting. So, you know, uh, when, it, when, when I first asked the Lord 30 years ago, I said, fasting, like, explain it to me. He goes, could you understand slow? That's what he said to me. <laughs> yeah, I understand slow. He goes, well, there you go. Fasting speeds things up. Do you want it? I'm like, okay, I get it. Okay. So, uh, you know, Charlie Robinson's dream just about ketosis was, was his dream was everything's out of order in the playground. All the kids were trying to go up the slide instead of down, and they can't. In the classroom, they're standing on their desks, and it's just a gong show. And the lady says to him, are you going to take the offering or not? So he says, okay. And he looks, and all the kids are all of a sudden sitting down, and their offering is the test. Their offering. Making an offering unto the Lord. Fasting is it's like an offering. And all of a sudden, everything's in order, and he looked on the board, and the word, the word appeared, ketosis. Now, I don't believe that means that everyone needs to be in ketosis per se, but it is, it is we, we, you know, physically just living off of the world, junk food, just easy, just like all the sugar, which takes you, you know, you can't be in ketosis. And so, um, yeah, that's, that's, uh, that's just, that was Charlie's dream, and me and Dean were literally just saying in the car, what should we do for a fast for Battle for Canada? I got to do something, but I, I need some energy. And so that was the first time I'd ever done it. And now I'm on, I'm on day 33. I started on New Year's Eve day in the morning, and I've just stayed in ketosis because I'm going to Quebec to face a judge and the minister there next Tuesday, Wednesday. So I'm sticking through. But next Friday, I'm out and bring goodies. Yeah. Yes. Sorry? Oh, no, uh, I, I'm, I'm in ketosis. Oh, sorry, no carbs. So, um, like, uh, like um, it, it's more than no sweets. Um, ketosis is actually a state that your body gets into where you actually start to burn fat. So I'm down about 24 pounds from a year ago. Because I started cutting out sugars last fall, last spring. But then November 1st, I cut it out for 39 days, lost 15 pounds. And on day 9 or 10, you switch from carbs and sugar to burning fat. And all of a sudden, you sleep better. And you just, uh, Jordan Peterson and his daughter have been doing it for a year and a half, two years. Some of them, like Jordan Peterson, this is what he eats, beef and salt. That's it. There's a rancher in, this, in Alberta. She's 82 years old. She looks late 50s. And she has eaten for 65 years beef and salt. That's it. People think you can't, but there's so much good vitamins. And, and remember, uh, it's the meat of a vegan. <laughs> Cows eat all the, vit- all the gr- grass and everything. Uh, and, and so... They, all the, all, it's all in there. Point is, you go into ketosis and you start to think clearer. You're not so clouded by sugar and all the garbage carbs that are now, used to be different. Even a lot of our vegetables, they're grown wrong and they're, they're, you just got to be careful. And so in ketosis, you can't eat peas and carrots. Too many carbs takes you out. 
And um, so uh, it's just a state, and apparently it's a, it's a God design. So warriors of the past, you know, when they're, they're hunting, or they're, they're, they would just kill an animal, and they just, like, you know, eat that. Well, you, they don't have flour and bread and baking soda or whatever, baking powder and all that stuff. They just eat meat. Inuit do it all the time. They just live on, and, and they, they're just healthy, and, and anyway, so... That's ketosis. It's about fasting. Fasting will speed up your walk with the Lord and the clarity and his voice. And um, yeah, so. <clears throat> Any other thoughts or questions? Yeah. Yes, sir. You're welcome. <laughs> Localized principalities, does it affect people, how they hear God, and so on and so forth? Oh, just, oh, just 100%. So I believe that God can give a strategy with, with a critical mass of people to actually dislodge, to bind the strong men and dislodge that principality. So we're a ways away from that here in Kelowna. Uh, but when they are in place through, bit, through accusation, bitterness, gossip, sin of the church, and rejection of God's ways and principles in life. It strengthens the principality, um, and, and, um, and then it, it, it dulls, the, the, it dulls the, and the Holy Spirit's not moving. And sure, and so it just causes a uh, blindness on the church, and uh, it, it's sometimes bad in religious belts. This is kind of a religious belt, or at least used to be and stuff. And it's just like, it's it's uh, there are strengthened principalities in a region, which through prayer and fasting and and worship strikes and unity and forgiveness, you can start to dislodge and dismantle them. You know, so uh, I believe this this would be the will of the Lord here for Kelowna. We'll just um, I know that God had given me a strategy for that in Kitimat, but I'll tell you, just uh, it, it was all hijacked. I don't want to get into it. But, um, you know, I've been, we've been talking a lot about accusation. By the way, if you want the, the voice of God to be clearer in your life, do not accuse anyone of stuff, especially people that eat things you don't understand. Other ministers, do you want the voice of God to be stifled or stumped? Uh, go into accusation against other people. Um, and, uh, you know, like we look at Naboth and his vineyard, Jezebel simply got two scoundrels, to falsely accuse him, he lost his life, lost his vineyard, just because of two liars. That's it. So, you know, we can lose, a region can lose its call, its destiny because of scoundrels, just ac accusers and people who, let me tell you one quick story about that. Um, I watched a prophet and some people come in from Texas. I was in Terrace at the time, in 01, 02, helping a church. So I got to sit in, and I wasn't a pastor yet, not till 03. But I got to sit in this ministerial meeting, 20 pastors around this circle. And this group of ministers who paid their own way to come to Terrace had this incredible word of the Lord and this, this, this uh, thing for the ministerial to do to move into a discipleship school. This guy was sharing his heart, and he shared one thing wrong. And he said, you know, da 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 and and we've, we've, we've heard Rick Joyner speak about this and, da, 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 and just like, and there was um, a minister there who was a chaplain to the old folks home. That was his pastoral role. He was a chaplain to the old folks home. He didn't like Rick Joyner. He poisoned every other minister against this guy. They all rejected the word of the Lord of these, this prophet who paid his own way and a team of them to come and minister. And I watched it. But I also watched that minister die one week later of a heart attack. Um, you know, uh, it's, it's, I've, I've watched people trash themselves, but also uh, kill the potential and move of God because of accusation and stuff. And it's a terrible, terrible thing. So, uh, yeah, yeah. But I hope that answers. It's just like, so let us not be found in accusation. Like I've said it like this. I said it on the reset. Some of you will not like Joel Osteen. Well, I would never, don't go to his church, but don't speak against him. Just leave him alone. 
he's not, you're, you're not over him. He's not, you're, you don't have to, well, we need to judge. Who said, you do not judge another man's servant. Sh- shut your mouth. Shut your mouth. Unless God puts you in a position of authority over them, you got to judge something. Okay, it's just like, but you don't. So just like, um, yeah. <clears throat> watch, watch your tongue. Yeah. Do not give your, do you, there's, there's two, there's two, um, there's two ministries going on in heaven right now. Jesus, whoever lives to make intercession for us, and the accuser of the brethren that goes day and night to accuse the brethren. There's two ministries right now. Watch who you align yourself with if you're going to be a voice for the Lord. All right? All right, well, uh, two minutes to nine. You guys have sat for two hours in those uncomfortable chairs again. It hurts the butt. <clears throat> All right, so um, let me just... Let me just say a, a prayer for you guys. And, and um, uh. <laughs> and as I say this, I'm so honored to be with you guys in this day and, and age as, with, as, as a shepherd here, because I am a shepherd, you know, an apostolic shepherd, but I'm a shepherd. And whatever it is, you know, that uh, just as a leader, just to, just to encourage you. And I'm so honored that you guys would just come and sit for two hours on a Friday night. You know, and just, just to, it speaks of hunger. And, and it reminds me of me when I was just starting out and as far as some of the things here. So, Father, I just thank you. Um, I just thank you for you, God, for the call, for the giftings, for your word, for the encouragements, the truths that we've read here tonight, for the different expressions of the prophetic and, and even the word of knowledge and dreams and, and the, the bubbling up prophet. And, and Father, I just, I just call forth your gifts through your people, whether it's being shepherds or teachers, pastors, prophets, apostles. I call forth, Lord God, the anointing I call forth a double portion of Elijah to Elisha to be voices in these days. And I, I, I pray, Lord God, for a, a retooling, a remantling from peacetime to wartime. Lord God, that we would see the enemy thrown down in this city, that we'd see the principalities thrown down, that we'd, we would see revival, reformation, that we would see a people who are so loved with you, just standing for you being used of you. So we say, here we are, Lord. Use us. Send us. Empower us. Heal us. Deliver us. Set us free. And may we give you glory. In Jesus' name, yeah, amen.